Well, hi, everybody. Uh, it's really great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and maybe some slightly newer ones or people I haven't had a chance to connect with recently. If you haven't met me or if you, it's been a while because it's been crazy times, right? Um, I'm Dr. Lisa Neer and I live in Portland, Oregon. And I am a new music mezzo soprano and a composer, and I teach both of those things. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk about composing for singers. It's a topic I come back to periodically. Um, some of you may have been present for um, a, a presentation I gave, I think, at Nakusa. That would have been ooh, like almost almost four years ago now, um, in the height of, of the start of the pandemic, when we moved all of that online. And um, that presentation focused a bit on, on text setting in detail and then also um, was was quite a big Q&A um, that took us down lots of really fun rabbit holes. So today I want to do something a little different. Um, I wanted to sort of talk about writing for singers, um, not from the most broad in general, because you can look that up. In fact, you can go on my website and I think there's a button that says download a free vocal range guide. And if it's still not there, if for some reason it's not there, find me. You can also find vocal ranges and sort of just the general like info on like what's a mezzo soprano and what's a tenor. You can find all of that. Um, and likewise, we could go into the weeds on any single area that we're going to talk about today in the same kind of detail that I've talked about text setting um, because it's all that that uh, worthy of, of detail. Um, but I thought we'd go kind of in the middle and I'm going to trust that you can go look up those ranges and those basic things on your own. And what you really might want is sort of an overview of some of the properties of singing, the properties of text setting, the properties of harmonic and rhythmic support, um, and a few insights on choral singing versus solo singing. And we might even get to a few little extended techniques, which sounds kind of fun. So um, I'll make a point to sort of pause periodically and to save some time at the end for your extended questions. But also, you know, we're a pretty, pretty small group. Um, please feel free to, you know, um, raise a hand in the video. I, I can only see some of you while I'm in presentation mode. Um, feel free to raise a hand with the raise hand feature, put a thing in a chat. Um, and if you are trying to get my attention and I'm not seeing because I'm like juggling some screens, um, then feel free to, you know, we're a small group, feel free to, to unmute and say, hey, Lisa, I have a question about that thing that you're saying. And, um, and let's talk about it. So um, just a couple parameters, because of course, singing is, is huge. I, I come at this from my background as a Western classical singer. So that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly today. I'm an English language speaker. I've been trained in singing diction for Italian, Latin, German, French, Spanish, and a bit of Russian and Slavic languages. There are a lot of other languages, right? And so I'm sure that there are things that I'm going to say today that don't apply in every single situation. And I know, trust that we're all smart enough to take what works for you in your situation and leave the rest or approach with curiosity the rest. And I'm excited to hear about all the different applications that you'll find across languages and situations I haven't yet sung in. And of course, um, the big thing about singing is every single singer is unique. They're going to have their voices that are unique. They're going to have their strengths and their challenging parts about their singing. They're going to have their particulars about how they like their notation. And so you may hear some different things than what I tell you today. What I can tell you today is that um, all the notation and all the other things that I suggest are the things backed up in books such as Behind Bars by Elaine Gould, which is the standard notation Bible for um, certainly American and I think also British, you know, music. Um, so if you're writing in the English language for uh, folks in the US and in the British Isles, then these are the conventions that publishers are using today. So let's talk about properties of the voice. The voice, like the flute, gets louder the higher it goes. Um, there are some folks who specialize in high floaty stuff, but generally speaking, the lower notes can never be as loud as the higher notes. And the medium notes can be moderately, um, moderately loud, but can't be as loud as the high notes. And that's just a property of the instrument. A property of the voice is that sung tones have vibrato, whether or not you perceive it. 
even straight tones when recorded and looked at using um, engineering and um, sound wave software show that there is an oscillation. It's a natural part of a sustained sound in a human instrument. And it's just whether or not we perceive it, right? So um, classical singers are trained, um, if you want to have any kind of career, to create consistent vibrato while we change pitches across the entire range. Some are better at straightening the tone out, some are not. But it's always just about straighter, not about truly straight. Only a computer, right, type sound or, or other instruments right, can create totally straight tones. This is a difference like between string instruments that create a vibrato, right? Um, versus the voice. The voice is always vibrating. So that's the property of the voice. Vo voices have a, a preference for movement rather than stasis. You can hear that when we talk. We inflect up and down, it feels good. If we sort of fall into monotone, that's very fatiguing to speak. It's also very fatiguing to sing in any one note or range for a really, really long time. Doesn't mean it can't be managed, but it's just not idiomatic. Pitch finding is from context and from internalization. Um, singers don't have frets, we don't have buttons, we don't have keys, and most of us don't have perfect pitch. Um, we have to get that context from the world around us and learn how our notes relate to the notes that we're hearing. Do they harmonize with it in a certain way? Do they feel like they're crunching in a certain way? I myself as an alto am frequently in a situation where I sing the same note but the other people around me change and I move from being the fifth of the chord to the seventh of the chord to a second away from the root of the chord. And even though I'm not moving, it feels really different to sing that same note. So singers have to internalize not just a single line, they have to internalize the harmonies around them. We are trained to sing uh, and in a context of tonality of major and minor. This is the vast majority of Western music that we're exposed to in popular culture, as well as in standard repertoire, which means that um, classical singers learn music that is closer to major and minor or, or things that can relate to that faster. They learn licks that can be related to those scales or slight deviations from those scales and from those triads or seventh chords faster. Then they learn different pitch collections because that's what we've internalized the most doesn't mean we can't learn and that some people don't get very good at sight reading atonal music, but generally speaking, the more dissonant, the more crunchy, the more leapy and disjunct, the longer it's going to take to internalize. Um, this is not a intelligence thing. It's a training thing. Singers need to breathe. Um, and this is true, but I don't really recommend that you mark rests for us regularly or add in a bunch of rests, I recommend that you notate the rhythms as simply as possible. Because if you start adding an eighth note here and a sixteenth note there of rest for us to breathe, it will look like it's very important for us to be silent and it becomes another data point to learn. And if you didn't really so much care about that and we're just trying to be super nice and be sure that we can breathe, you've just created more work. A lot of singers can, can sing a lot longer than maybe you can if you're not a trained singer and you're composing and trying to guess, we can probably sustain our breath longer. Um, if we can't, we're pretty good at, at sneaking breaths. We do it all the time. So um, while yes, if you're talking about like a vocal quartet and you want a consistent, really, really long note be, to be held with absolutely no break, you might wanna to talk to the specific people you're writing for. But in almost every other context, um, I don't think it's useful to, to mark in breaths. If there's a dramatic reason to put a breath in, yes, that you, that you feel is, is essential to your vision. Um, but otherwise, I would, I would trust us to choose when to breathe. Property of the voice is that we have range, which is the lowest note we can sing all the way to the highest note we can sing. But that more important than that is the tessitura, which is the subset that we would prefer to sing most of our notes in. So my range as a professional mezzo-soprano, the, the range I sing in public, low G below middle C to high B flat at the top, the, the first ledger line above the staff is not that different than a lyric soprano, right? A lyric soprano is gonna have to sing the C, probably the D. They might have an extra extension, they might not. The difference is 
my voice would prefer to be in a lower spot for more of the notes by about a whole step to a third. So the tessitura matters a lot more because it's more fatiguing for me to sing in a higher register. For the high soprano, it might be very fatiguing to sing in their lower register, right? In their chest voice for a while or, or in, the, in the lower part of their mixed voice for a while. So tessitura is more important generally speaking, than, than absolute range. Likewise, the high note itself is usually not the issue or the low note itself is not the issue so much as how we approach and leave it. So voices like to move. And if you look at standard rep, which we're gonna look at in a second, you will see that high notes tend to be, just like if you took any theory way back in the day at the college level, you might've learned some part writing that talked about approaching a high note and resolving down. These things feel pretty good to have a leap up that resolves down from that high note is that that's something that feels pretty good. Um, so how we approach it rather than stepwise, 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 up a half step, up a half step. I've been singing at the top of the step for a really, 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 really long time and I'm getting super tired. This is fatiguing, can be manageable, um, but, but can be really fatiguing in choral music or in solo music. Um, I, I've been looking at a lot of choral music lately that's asking an awful lot of the sopranos, actually, to, to sit for, for pages um, above the staff um, on Fs and As. And these are sopranos who have no problem singing in high C. So it's not range. It's fatiguing to sit up there for a really long time. Tessitura matters more. So tessitura can, can refer to the preferred range that a singer would like to be singing most of their notes in. But it can also refer to where the notes fall for a singer or a voice part in a choral piece in a given piece. Oh, this, this choral piece has a high tessitura for the sopranos. It's keeping them high for a really long time, right? Uh, problems in soprano, soprano, alto, alto music, if you're writing for treble choirs, is that sometimes those alto twos get shoved in the bottom because they're holding down the bass, right? For a really long time, a very fatiguing low tessitura. So we talk about tessitura a lot. Um, and these things have, they, they do have a, a relationship to stamina. And I think it's important to just note that unique among performers, um, the singer is both the player and the instrument itself. And so when you as a composer are working with singers, I think it's important to be aware of that vulnerability that a singer can't go and upgrade their voice at the store, or they can't go switch out their reed. And I'm not saying that there aren't really, really hard things about doing any instrument well as a performer, there are. But a specific thing with singers is it's completely about identity. And it's a psychologically controlled instrument. We can't see the things that are going on down in our throats. And we can't say, please, trichothyroid extend one extra millimeter so that I can do X, Y, Z. We can't have that kind of control. So we learn by feel, by imagery. Yes, of course, by physiology, but a lot of that still is just imagining and sending signals. So there's something a little mysterious. You don't get to decide what kind of voice you are. I can't turn myself into a soprano if I want to. So when a singer is communicating with you about maybe something that they want changed or something that's giving them a challenge. Or if you are communicating to them and asking them, can they do something, you know, do it. But also I, I just encourage people to do it with a sense of compassion and also a sense of trust that it's really, really hard for singers to tell a composer, this is uncomfortable because there's always a feeling that we have inside that if we were just a better singer, we could do it. And in a given moment, it's not possible, even if it's a very young singer who's gonna go off and, and extend their range by a million notes down the line, in that moment, while they're rehearsing their piece, there is no technical breakthrough. Their voice and their tessitura and their range in this moment for this rehearsal is just what it is, you know? And, the, and that's their reality. And so if they're asking for something, believe me, they beat themselves up in the practice room a lot before coming to you with that ask. Um, and we are a psychologically controlled instrument. So if, there is uncertainty about pitch, rhythm, meter, harmonic language around us. This leads to uncertainty in the breath. How much breath pressure am I using? How big is my mouth? Um, what are my vocal folds stretching to? So singers have to get really, really sure of themselves in a way that um, 
I, I didn't need to so holistically as a pianist. There were different things that were challenging when I was a pianist. Um, but, you know, if I'm not hearing the note I'm going to sing, or if I'm not sure on my rhythm or on my entrance, this leads to a whole host of things at the physiological level, breath-wise, space-wise, phonation-wise, that are just not, not at optimum. So whatever we can do to reinforce that within the context of the musical language that you're, you're writing, you know, and this can be done in many, many different styles, will help out. So, um, oh, cool. There's one more before my example. Um, singers perform text most of the time or sound effects or vocalizes sometimes that, that can usually be described as components of speech or, or speech sounds, vowel and consonant type noises. Um, a lot of vocal color is gonna be accessed through the text you choose, through the emotions, the moods, the colors, the storytelling properties. Um, and through your expressive markings and how you lead a singer through that. So narrative is a big thing. Most singers have a background in theater or musical theater or opera um, or storytelling, and they're very interested in text. So this is something you can lean into to get um, really awesome um, impacts in your music. We sing legato by default. So we'll talk about this in notation. The slur for singers does not mean legato. For classical singers, legato is default. The slur actually denotes hold a syllable this long over a group of notes if you're singing many notes um, in the same uh, syllable. So um, you don't have to mark legato. And you don't have to mark, um, usually, you don't have to mark phrasing marks the way you might for a piano or a harp with a, with a slur. Um, the phrasing is usually determined by the text. If you're really concerned about a certain group of, of, of words, you can use like a dotted or a dashed slur to show that if you really feel like you need that, that information. Um, but otherwise, we're, we're going to follow the text. Um, our default will be to, to sing vowel as long as possible and to, to put consonants on the outside of each syllable at the early end and then at the late end. Um, if you want something else, say it. It can be really cool. Um, and I'll also just add that, um, I don't know if it's a property of voice, but a property of vocal music, <laughs> historically, has been that, that a lot of classical and popular music repeats words and repeats lines of text, either in the chorus or in the setting of the text in some other way. And it, it's really helpful, actually, um, because when we sing, no matter how good our diction is, we are stretching words out. And if we want the audience to catch everything, it, it really doesn't mind hearing it twice or three times sometimes. And I see um, that a lot of um, contemporary music that I do that is really great, it tends to mostly be syllabic text setting, one syllable per note. Um, and it also tends to not repeat almost anything. Uh, and that can be cool, but it is also dangerous <laughs> because if the audience doesn't catch something, you are probably not going to be blamed. The singer is going to be blamed for having bad diction. And it is our job to have good diction. And also, you know, it's a lot to convey. I mean, how many people can't tell you the lyrics of their favorite band song, even though they've listened to it a million times, right? So is it really, you know, it's not, it's not just classical singers who, who are sometimes being told, hey, I don't know what you're saying. Um, we, we work really hard at it, but also repetition is a good way to help us with that. All right, so I just wanted to show a piece of, of standard rep to show a few of these things off. So this is Ich stand in dunklen Träumen by Clara Schumann from Opus 13. Um, and I just want to, you know, take a look at how um, the line moves up and down. So we have, we don't really have stasis. We, we approach the high note by a little leap and then we come down. This is super idiomatic. Um, we get to dip down into the low register. Um, what else is cool in this? Um, what else do I want to show? Yeah, let's take a look at, in a moment, we'll look at some things about um, harmony and pitch support. Um, and one of the things I, I'm going to talk about, and like, I'll just talk about it here, is that it's not really necessary to double the melody all the time. Um, you will see that sometimes Clara is, so we have a little melody here. But then look, she leaps above and creates a beautiful... Um, counter melody in the piano for a moment here, where she sort of overlaps the singer and then sneaks back up with them. And when she is 
doubling the melody. She's also projecting the harmony. I mean, this is a really transparent texture, right? Because it's very um, clear triadic harmony. So apply this to whatever cool chord clusters you want. Um, but I think it's a good way of showing that across the bar, the new accidentals are supported sometimes where they occur, but sometimes not, sometimes down an octave, like here's these Fs down the octave, here they are at the octave, at the same place. Um, she's creating the, the sort of wash of sound that gives the singer the support they need, which is really more important than doubling the exact notes all the time. She's also creating a really clear sense of the meter. Obviously, this is a piece that just stays in one meter all the time, easier to do. But notice that for a lot of this, there is a really clear downbeat on, um, with a, a low note. Um, there is pulsing you know, eighth notes creating that sense of meter. But she gets creative with it with the, the triplet creates a little bit of a sense of momentum. So it's not boring, right? It's tra this is a fairly straightforward song um, for certainly by, by 21st century standards, but she gets a lot of mileage out of it without it sounding like there's melody in the right hand and accompaniment boom chuck chucks in the left hand. And it doesn't sound like it's babying the singer and saying, oh, I'm, I have to double you. She's not chained to that, right? So I really encourage you, if you're writing for singers, we are trained on this stuff. We're trained on art song. We're trained on the French and the German art song of the end of the classical and through the Romantic period. We're trained on early 21st century and 20th century American and British art song, Vaughn Williams, Amy Beach, Barre, um, Fanny Mendelssohn, right? So, Go on to IMSLP and look at some of this music and you will see the principles that I'm talking about, about idiomatic text setting and idiomatic writing for the voice and idiomatic support and be able to um, extrapolate and take what you need from there. I'll also just point out that this is a fairly modest range. Art song traditionally is written within about an octave and a third to an octave and a fifth. And I just told you I have two and a half octave range, right? So why do this? Well, most singers sing an art song and they may sing your song on a recital of 60 minutes or more and it can't all be the most demanding aria. You see a lot of really rangy stuff that's super cool and that I can't program all in the same concert, right? It's really, really demanding to, to sing a high B, right? Um, it's really, really demanding to sing a high B and a low G in the same piece. It's really, really rangy. It's asking a singer to change because we can do it, but it's demanding and we can't do it for 60 minutes straight. So that's one reason. Another reason is that I'm a professional and I've been at this for a while, but guess who sings a lot of songs? High schoolers doing contest, undergraduates who have to do junior, senior recital, sometimes even a sophomore half recital, graduate students, people who are training. So I can sing Chant and Duke and I think I do a pretty darn good job of it as a professional. And my high schooler can sing it and they can do a really good job of it as well and have tons of success. So it's something to consider that um, having things available in multiple keys and one of the things that makes it easier to transpose actually and to find a key that's decent for a pianist and also for a singer is if you're in a little bit more moderate range because if you go down a minor third and it's in a million flats and sharps, you'd be like, how about one more half step <laughs> and make your pianist happy? Yeah. So I just think um, art song is a great way to look at that. Um, Okay, this is a lot of stuff. Questions for me before we talk about properties of text? Uh -huh. Yes, I was um, I was going to ask you to amplify a little bit your point about legato being natural. Mm. Are you just talking about a notational convention or is it something about how, uh, uh, vocal production? Okay, so I think I said, maybe I'm trying to remember exactly what I said. So vibrato, vibrato is natural. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, vibrato uh, is natural. You also said legato is default. Default. Legato is default. As a wind instrument, we're taught to exhale smoothly through your text. So you don't have to note, you don't have to notate legato, and it's not necessary to put like a slur over a group of notes to say, sing this legato, because that's just what we do naturally. If you want something else, if you want accented, if you want staccato, 
go forth and do that. Does that make so sense? If, yes. So if you were writing a melisma, would you use this, uh, uh, a phrase mark? Yes. In fact, I am required by notation to use a phrase mark. Okay. All right. That, that was probably the, the detail I was, yes. I was confused by. It. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, we will we'll look at an example of this in a moment. Um, actually, does she have one in here? She probably doesn't. She only has yeah. two. Uh, oh, yeah. The first page. Here we bottom. go. Thank you. E the... Okay, cool. So this is an old score, but it still is using the slur as it should to denote that these two notes are sung on the first syllable of this word. And that's necessary, that's required. Likewise, this extender line to show that you're gonna keep singing and through this tie, this is also required on this final syllable. These things help the singer no matter whether our eye is in the music or our eye is in the text to know what we're doing. Um, because our eyes are constantly skipping back and forth. Here's something that this does not do that is now preferred. Clara, well, Clara's editor <laughs> in this older edition on MSLP is not beaming the vocal music the way they are beaming the piano music. They are beaming the piano music by beat. They are stemming the syllabic text setting, the one syllable per note text setting, which is most of this. This is no longer not preferred. It is now the preferred convention in Behind Bars by Elaine Gould, the Bible of notation, that these things should be beamed the same. Why? Some singers who sing only really old music say, I don't like that idea. I wanna hear, see all the stems all the time if it's syllabic, and that's fine for them, I suppose. It's not so great when you're switching between seven, eight and nine, eight and five, 16 and a bindling different things. You've got to, got to, got to show us where the beats are. It's not so great for the pianist or the other instruments performing with us when they're trying to tick out and see if they're matching with us and the stems are all over the place. So when you look at these older scores, you're going to see some other conventions. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, um, my question has to do with the proverbial break. Um, yeah. There's a certain point and and every everyone's voice where it's like you know on their way up i don't know if it's just outside of the tessitura if that's considered the tessitura or the break but um mm -hmm. is there a way of kind of trying to avoid messing around in there to make that hard to sing you know? yeah so th this is a great question and if you open up five or six different textbooks as i have done on vocal pedagogy they're all going to describe these things slightly differently and annoyingly so they're gonna use the words break. They're gonna use the words transition. They're gonna use the words passaggio. They're gonna say there's one or two or multiple, <laughs> okay? So if you zoom out for most voices between C and F in the low part of their range and C and F an octave above are two transition points somewhere in there or somewhere across those, those notes, okay? Mm -hmm. At these points, physiologically, down in the throat, the vocal tissues are doing a thing where they're switching which group of muscles is dominant and therefore how thick or how thin those vocal tissues are, not just for pitch, but for color. At the same time, there is an acoustical shift that starts to happen when we go through these transition points and different vowels and different resonance things are getting boosted, we call them formants, these are other vibration things in addition to the note you're actually hearing, okay? And this is also creating a sense of shift physically in the body experientially for the singer and how they perceive themselves. And to a certain extent can, ex can, can be something that we hear as a shift of color. Most of us are most concerned about the upper break, the, the transition to um, what most of us would call head voice, what some folks would say for the tenors, baritones, and basses is a upper mix or lighter full voice mechanism that's not falsetto. Again, I'm sorry that everybody describes these differently, right? If you're talking to a singer and writing specifically for them, I think it's always great to ask them what their stinky notes are. What's the note they don't want to sit on, right? Or what are the notes they don't want to sit on? And these can be kind of thought of similarly to a clarinet or a bassoon break note that like it's easier to move through them but not to sit on them. 
as a professional, it's my job to be able to achieve things on any of those notes, right? But if you were to be writing for some of my high schoolers, I could tell you that for most of them, anything up to about A or B flat is can sound like a very unified voice above the C, above middle C, and then a lot of them have a very pronounced crack into a fluty, non, not yet very resonant head voice yeah. as they go through that. Sometimes as they get a little higher towards E, F, G and climb out of that, they hit another spot where they have a bunch of resonance and they actually have some really nice high voice like cut that they're starting to develop. And that's the part that's that acoustic shift that they haven't figured out yet. Yeah. So you can open up books and you can find a million different people saying exactly where the the break note or sometimes they'll have the lower entry point and the upper entry point for one of these or both of them and i find it very confusing which is why i say zoom out and you can think generally speaking about these zones of transition roughly somewhere between c and f and then c and f in the upper register um and, and, you know, what we're talking about is below that C, like for me, below middle C is the zone of like really total chest voice possibility, mm. right? Middle C to F-ish, we're climbing into a place where I'm mixing more. It's not quite so chesty. Above that F, it's really not possible to full chest out for most treble singers. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess. I. I guess I can't avoid the ranges because that only give me F sharp yeah. to B. <laughs> no, you can't avoid, right. So again, movement is yeah. the thing. And yeah. then if you're dealing with a, specific, with a specific singer, then ask them, what are the notes you don't wanna sit on, mm -hmm. right? And then if a singer comes to you and they're singing your piece and they say, you know what, could you transpose this down half a step? This would be so much better. Then say, sure, because it's as easy as pushing a button, right? I mean, I know it's a little bit more than that because we got to look through and be sure the fingering works out and all the accidentals for the pianist. But I'm just saying, like, truly, it is very individual. So you're going to have one group of people who are just used to dealing with it, the professionals. And then you're going to have another group of people who maybe you can be your very best friends by offering several keys, you know. So, um, so as a composer who's publishing, it might be good to have various uh, editions, I guess, in different ranges. Uh -huh. as yeah. Well. And again, I suggest go look at like Schubert leader, low, medium and high volumes that are on IMSLP or Far A, you know, art song. Go look and see what are the differences between their like how how far apart are they? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you'll get a sense really quickly by looking through three or four or five songs. Where ish do the low notes, the low voice songs sit? Where ish do the medium voice songs sit? And where ish do the high voice songs sit? You can also again, I have a sheet on my website and if it's not on there just email me that was I have art song ranges for low medium and high that that are my suggested sort of general ranges yeah thank you absolutely other questions okay press on properties of text okay so spoken text has musical qualities. We have accented and unaccented syllables in a lot of languages that, that I'm working in. We also have long and short syllables and the ability to lengthen things when we're really excited, right? Or to move through text quickly in certain words um, and certain syllables, we tend to move through quicker than others. Um, oh, Graham says he wasn't able to find it on the website. Okay, Graham, sorry, I will get that. I, I may have switched it out for a different freebie at some point on um, voice ranges. Uh, I'll find that and I'll send it out. Thank you for letting me know. Um, we also inflect up and down. So we have pitch in our speech. Um, we have what actors call operative words, which are the, the most important words in a sentence and they often convey meaning. Um, so I could say, um, you know, I love Chris, and it means different if I say I love Chris or I love Chris. These things, based on what I've em emphasized, mean different things. As an actor, we would say that I'm changing up the operative word. 
And operative words have a lot to do with your take as a composer on what you want to express in this text. So um, I really encourage people to spend time with your text before you set it, giving some attention to how the words sound when you speak them out loud, underlining the accented syllables, circling the words you feel are the most important, the operative words, paying attention to how you, if you were to sort of dramatically read it like you were at a poetry reading or in a monologue or something, you know, it doesn't have to be good, like you don't have to perform it for anyone. But if you were to put in the inflection, what do you notice and how can that inform what you do in the music that you're writing? Oh, cool. Thank you, Vance. Oh, no, maybe not. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, that's an offer. If, if you sign up with your email, you'll get the free guide. Yeah, you just sign up with your email, get the free guide. And then if you don't want to be on my mailing list, just don't subscribe. I won't care. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, so we talk about, you know, this, this sort of natural speech rhythm and speech pitches and the, the way we tend to, to say words is we call it prosody. Um, on top of this, we have what's going on in the mouth, which has a big deal to do with whether this is going to be easy or hard or, or really difficult for your singers. Vowels are either open like an ah, medium like an a, or closed like an e. Literally, there's more stuff going on in my mouth in closed vowels than there are in open vowels. A property of singing high notes is that we've got to open our mouth really tall and we have to lift the back of our throat, a space called the soft palate, which is the space that lifts up when you yawn. And now you're all gonna yawn and feel bad that you're yawning and I don't care because now you'll know exactly where it is. So don't feel bad. I have to do this to sing your high note. There's no other way. All consonants are closures of the mouth in some way. So because of this, if you set a bunch of words up super high and they have closed vowels like E and they have consonants like P and D and K that require me to close off my mouth, this is gonna be more challenging for me to sing. If you look at most opera arias and the very, very high note that they're singing, it's usually on an open vowel like an A ah or an uh, and they've usually said the text a million times before, and they usually say the consonants on a lower note, jump up to the high note, and then finish the word down back in the staff. That's an important thing to think about when you're choosing your dramatic big moment for your high note, what vowel is in that word, and to try to aim your, your high notes for a word that will fit that. If you don't, you, you are risking a few things. One, we will just have to do what we do. Open up, minimize your consonants to sound good, to make a sound at all, to not crack, to not make no noise whatsoever, which is a bad thing. Or we'll have to try to get the words out, even though we're risking being uncomfortable and cracking and maybe not sounding so good. And then we go off stage and people are like, well, her high notes weren't that good. Uh, I couldn't understand what she was saying. And is that my fault as the singer or is it my fault as the composer, right? Could be my fault as the composer, composer error, I like to say sometimes when I'm working with, um, you know, workshopping pieces of mine and something's just not working. I'm like, oh, I think that's composer error. Let me change that, right? Um, another really tried and true thing, remember us talking about repetition, um, say that, that text a lot before you say it up high. So then it doesn't matter so much if we can't understand that final time that's up super high and the singer just opens up a lot more and who cares and the audience falls in the rest. Pitch and harmonic support, we talked about this a little bit. Um, so just most, most of us don't have perfect pitch. Most of us who do contemporary music don't have perfect pitch. If you wanna write for your perfect pitch friend, a piece that only they can sing, blessings upon you, but don't be surprised when no one else sings it because it's just, this is a really a ton of work if it's if it's something that's really only achievable um, by someone who can pick every single pitch out of thin air. Um, be aware when you're trying to give us some support that notes 
at the same pitch level or the octave above, if that's the only way to get my note or my harmony, can get lost in my overtones. They're actually some of the harder things to hear because the own, my own sound and the vibrations are a little bit trickier to pick out. So it's something to be aware of. You don't have to never do it, but just keep it in mind, especially if you're writing a very thorny passage and that's really the only way for us to get the pitch, you might wanna consider projecting some of that context. And I'm using the word context because it doesn't have to be the exact pitch I'm singing, right? It might be the third or the fifth or, I don't know, sometimes I've even tuned to a tritone if that's the musical language. I can find that, you know? Um, but where, where it's being projected registrally can make a difference. Do double a dissonant note in a cluster in the piano. Sometimes I see this where people really want to create like a minor second between the voice and the piano. And so they split it up. They give the, the C to the piano and the D flat to the singer. And the truth is, if the piano just plays the C and the D flat, that's easy because they've got 10 fingers. And for me, it's a million times easier to tune my half step in when there's something else jangling around that reinforces that that pitch that in other contexts would be wrong, right? In all the other tonal music I'm singing, if I'm coming a half step away, that's wrong. But this time it's right. It's way easier to find if it's just somewhere in there. And the piano has, if we're, you know, we're talking about piano because most of us are writing um, art song or even our first version of our operas and our choral music, right? Even if we want to expand it to orchestra in a piano version for rehearsal purposes or for the first go, right? A piano has a very, very clean attack and a very short decay. I promise no one will notice that your minor second is also in the piano um, or, or, you know, whatever that interval is. It just makes it a million times easier for us to find. Yes, if there's a really challenging note, give us the context before we enter, you know? So if everything is projecting E flat, E flat major, E flat major, E flat major, and you want me to enter on E natural major, and nothing happens until the moment I sit on it, I can do it, it's a half step away. But if you make that harmonic shift before I come in, that's way easier. You know, so, so earn those moments that you really want the sudden hard thing. And then the rest of the time, if you lead in, you know, singers, again, we are, we are a, a group of performers uniquely who are expected to perform a lot of things memorized. And whether or not you choose to write music that you intend to be memorizable, know that we listen for a handoff. And most vocal music has some kind of lick in the instruments that leads us into, right? Da dun 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 and you enter. There's something that happens. We're used to hearing that. And so singers kind of uniquely, since we can't be reading on stage as much because we have to memorize more, we get really good at hearing and memorizing a lot of the context in a way that some other performers don't because they're, they're relying on different skills because of a different performance tradition, right? So if you can hand us off those new pitch collections or those new tonal areas or there's no cluster areas so that we can catch on to them, breathe and enter with confidence, we're, we're gonna be off to the races a lot better. Okay, no worries, Liz. Nice to see you. Um, and go back. If you're somebody who took a part writing class in college, and I know not everyone was, go back to that. Part writing came out of vocal polyphony, right? In the Renaissance and, and in the Baroque era, that's where all these guidelines came from because we studied a bunch of that music. And it was almost all vocal music, right, to start with. It's easier to step into a dissonance than to leap into a dissonance, right? Um, there's also some of these guidelines about leaping up to and resolving down by step, or you know, there's a lot of things in those part writing rules that have to do with idiomatic voice writing, what feels good. And it is voice writing. I said part writing, but it was voice writing, you know, it was writing for singers. Um, hello, next slide. Are there any particular part writing textbooks or sources that you would recommend? Mm, that's a great question. It's hard for me to recommend because while I took theory and taught theory, I didn't love any of my textbooks. <laughs> I just use them because I knew them. 
Um, hmm. So the one that a lot of people use and that you can probably get like an old version of like a couple editions old on eBay pretty cheap would be Galden, G-A-U-L-D-I-N, Harmonic Practice and Tonal Music. And I would not recommend if you do this that you study it with rapt attention. I would just like flip through and read the stuff that you're interested in and like have it as a resource. And they do have sort of a summary of part writing guidelines. And you know, a lot of it has things in it that a lot of us don't mind anymore, like parallel fifths and parallel octaves and things like that, that maybe aren't so applicable, but it will definitely have that. I bet some libraries would have it too. Um, so I feel like that or, um, oh gosh, I don't know what other, does anybody else have a theory textbook that they, they use that they liked? Adam, do you have one that you've liked? No? Yeah, I don't love Galden, but it exists and I think the old editions are cheap. Yeah, my theory teacher back in college actually uh, pick and chose from a number of texts, so we cool. didn't we didn't even have like a, a textbook that we worked from. Mm -hmm. It was just mm -hmm. like here's what we're doing today, and yeah. we cobbled together. A lot of them have to do with um, some of this like kind of idiomatic writing, um, so how things move. Um, but they, they also have a lot of, of kind of concern about independence because that was a big idea in polyphony. Um, and it's a big deal if you care about like writing a fugue or something, but otherwise it, it may or may not really. But like some of the other guidelines are things like if you're trying to distribute notes across um, across four voices, like soprano, alto, tenor, bass, right? Um, and there's a chord change if there's a pitch in common keeping the same person on that pitch right so smooth lines stepwise motion how to minimize lots of disjunct motion which is not a bad idea um because it it makes for easier singing and kind of keeps your chord members distributed low medium high right across um the soprano alto tenor bass or violin violin viola cello whatever you're writing for right keeps people from leaping around all over the place the other big one that comes to mind is just thoughts about doubling. Um, so if you have like, if you're trying to write a three note chord, but you've got four voices, what do you do with that fourth voice, right? Um, or whatever it is, whether it's a triad or a cluster or whatever your harmonic language is. So um, that's the other thing that I think is kind of useful to think about is, from, those, from those guidelines would be the doubling guidelines. Parallel fifths can be harder to tune. That is a great point, Antonio. Yeah, absolutely. So there are some reasons uh, to consider these when we're writing modern music, whatever our language um, of harmony or of you know combining notes are. Um, um, a question: You you have a line here, uh, project the harmony across the bar. Can can you elaborate on that? For sure. Yeah. So I'm trying to see if I have. Do I have another example here? Let's go back to Clara Schumann for a second. So, you know, what Clara is doing rather than um, rather than doubling the tune all the time is she's including notes of the tune in the chords that the piano is playing. But the piano has its own rhythmic pattern, right? And it has its own motives. So here in, in the second page, she starts this repetition where there's the triplet followed by four eighth notes, right? And there's this leap where there's the low note. So that has its own profile while still giving the context for the singer so that the singer is awash in whatever the chord is. And even if in, in moments um, there's sort of stepwise notes, does she have some stepwise notes in here that aren't double? She doubles a lot of them, doesn't she? Um, but you know, like truly, even if she didn't, like here as the singer steps down, even if she didn't parallel, it's fine. Because if she were to keep projecting this chord, we have our we have our connection point with that E flat chord. And then it's stepwise in the context that can be understood in terms of a scale or a modified scale very easily. Right? Okay. So yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, sometimes I think people feel so concerned about giving us some support that they feel really married to like doubling every note we sing. And um, and that's thoughtful, but not usually necessary. Um, okay. Rhythmic 
stuff to think about. Just be aware that we say our constants ever so slightly before the beat or the note. This isn't something you have to worry about, but just know that we, we do that so the vowel comes on the beat. Um, sometimes every once in a while I'm working with musicians who haven't worked with singers as often and they are like, you're coming in early, you're coming in early because they're hearing my consonant. And so it's a little bit of a, just a, an adjustment moment for them to, to get used to the fact that we land the, the vowel on the beat. Um, really important is to align um, thoughtfully your accented syllables with accented beats and division of the beats. So um, when we see music as singers that doesn't do this, we our jokey line is that the accents were on the wrong syllable. And it's because if you were to set the words, like for example, the word syllable, which has an accent on beat one, on the first, the first syllable of the word is accented. If you were to set it so that the downbeat was on the second syllable, the la, and the sill, was a pickup. One, two, three, four, syllable, right? It doesn't sound like the word anymore. And it makes it tricky because now the singer has to go, do I sing it and lean into this accent? One, two, three, four, syllable. Do I try to work against it and accent the eighth note leading into that? One, two, three, four, syllable. Now I start to shift what the musicians around me feel like the beat is, because if I accent that pickup too much, it sounds like I'm jumping in half a beat too early. And I have a, I'm saying this from experience. I've done this to try to sell a text, and it threw the whole ensemble off. An ensemble that, if it's not the piano, usually doesn't have my part. So if it sounds like a downbeat, and they're doing chamber vocal music, and they're trying to help me out, they all jump a half step, or a half a beat, and now we're off, right? So very cool thoughtful awesome cool syncopation is really different than unthoughtful aligning or misaligning of accented beats and accented or non accented syllables what this means is you might have to bar your music a little differently you might have to change some time signatures a bit more if you really have things where if you were to stay in like four four all the time things would start to get wonky with your text setting it actually starts to become better to add in that 6-8 or 7-8 or 5-8 bar because it just sounds and looks more like the way the text is because you're dealing with a, a situation where there's already musical information in that text. Um, this is going to help the singer be understood. It's going to help your ensemble. It's going to help us to rehearse your music more quickly and effectively. And also, it's just going to make your music look more like what it, what it sounds like. I have an example of this. So here's a piece of mine where I change time signatures a lot so that the downbeats sound like downbeats. We must be willing to place the C anemone within our vote. That's what I wanted, right? If I kept us in 6 8, now we would have an eighth note here tied over and i don't even know what would happen over here right it, it would get extremely messy but because for me we must be willing to place ah uh, one of my hyphens got out of the way i'm going to talk about this in a second but the hyphens get hidden sometimes by our notation software uh, but what i heard was we must be willing to place the c anemone within our vote that's the that's the text stress i wanted Right? So I wanted to write the music so that the, the important words landed as downbeats, the words that sound like downbeats land on the downbeat. And it makes it way easier to put together. Um, we must place the choral's value before broken pro policies. So, you know, it it's, can seem sometimes like all these time signature changes are really challenging. And this is a piece for professionals. Um, or for grad students at least, but it's still better to change the, the meters and to bar your music accordingly. And a lot of the work I do when with students in my studio is helping them take a, an initial draft of, of a piece and rebar it a little bit. And it's really normal. So if you've been writing a piece for a while and you haven't examined your barring, because maybe you were thinking of it in three, four when you started and didn't realize that later you were doing something else, that's totally normal. Print it out 
re-examine it, go back to speaking your text, and maybe shift a few, a few things over different bar lines and change your time signatures. It's really, really helpful. Um, and it's helpful for the instruments that, that are performing with singers too. I think that's what I wanted to show with that. Let me go back. Oh, we talked about that, great. Oh, here's another thing. Singers are taught not to show the beat in their body. Okay, so this is another thing to be aware of. Why is all of this so important, right? What are some of the differences? The convention for recital is that we stand in that crook of the piano and we do not look at the pianist, right? First of all, if we did, you can't hear me anymore, right? But it's also, we're supposed to be creating a world for you. We're trained to do that. We're not supposed to show, we're not supposed to cue with our head. I had to learn how to cue the first time I did chamber music with some instruments because I'm like, no, no, I'm not supposed to do that. Right? So, okay, if you're writing chamber music, maybe we will. But generally speaking, if you're writing opera, if you're writing choral music, if you're writing um, art song, right? Generally speaking, we're not supposed to do that. So this is another reason why it's super important that the, the music looks and sounds the way you want it and the way the words look and sound. Because when we're in recital, the pianist is watching us, they're watching our breath, they're watching our mouth move from behind and they're getting just partial information. Right? They're getting like this much information, right? And based on that, they're gonna jump and follow us if something looks like a downbeat that's not, right? And so you want us to get that right and you don't wanna give your pianists a heart attack. Um, so if you can avoid bass and beat and pulse confusion, that will help us out a lot. And yes, none of this means that you shouldn't do groovy, cool syncopation. If you look at really syncopated pop music, which I look at all the time in my studio because my students bring it in, and they want to sing Beyonce and they want to sing Taylor Swift, there's a lot of syncopation, but there's a lot of not. In between the syncopated things are measure after measure and phrase after phrase of perfectly aligned accented syllables on accented beats constantly. Prosody, text setting. You want to look at some other really good examples of this in English. Um, Rafe Von Williams, Florence Price, Amy Beach, um, Melissa Dunphy, living composer. Um, you want to look at it in some Spanish and Armenian, Gabriela Lena Frank. Um, in choral music, well, again, Melissa Dunphy, Forrest Pierce, um, Jessica French, Drew Swadish, Carolyn Quick. So many people. Those are some people that come to mind who do a lot of a lot of really cool stuff and a lot of inventive stuff in a lot of different harmonic and rhythmic languages. And they do it in a way that is as smart as possible at conveying things and helping us out. Okay, we looked at that. Cool. Extended technique. Here's a list of some extended techniques that you might want us to do, and they're really fun. Straight ur tone singing. Uh, we talked about this. Um, I really encourage people to use things like straight ur tone singing or as straight as comfortable singing um, if you're not working with somebody who specifically loves it, because it's, it's a matter of some um, discomfort for some singers and other singers not. Um, usually, the rule of the game with straight, straight or straight ur tone singing is Sometimes, yes, all the time, not so much, unless they're a specialist, right? Um, straight in, straightening a tone, once we've learned to have audible vibrato, is a little bit of muscular effort, or a lot of muscular effort, depending on who you are. It is a skill that some people get super good at. Renaissance singers, early music singers tend to do it easier. Lighter voices tend to do it easier. Wagnerian sopranos, not so much, right? And so, be aware of who you're writing for and who you're working with. Um, I tend to write things like straight ur tone or as, uh, as straight as comfortable. And then I also like to usually give a context, like a, um, a expressive marking, you know, that, that also kind of gives them a color to aim for. Um, usually, generally speaking, easier to straighten in the lower parts of the range. Okay, usually. Some people are good at straightening in the high range. Um, but for a lot of us, vibrato, breath support, and the ability to sing really high notes over an orchestra, which is what we're trained to do, we're all taught as one gigantic big muscle combination. And it's just really hard to turn it off down there, or I'm sorry, up there. 
Vibrato width and rate is something you can play with. Um, again, this is generally a little easier in the medium to low range for most singers. Um, but you can ask people to have a wide vibrato. I've seen people like write different length, different kinds of squiggles. You know, like a tighter squiggle is is more fast vibrato, and then a, a, a wider wavy line. And you you have to say what these things are. There are very few extended techniques for singers that are at all um, unified in their notation. So please always explain what you mean. Um, that's really that's a really cool one. Um, speaking, you can have spoken lines. You can have things that are spoken in a specific rhythm with no inflection specified. You can definitely tell us like monotone if you want or just natural speech inflection. You can also give inflection like with X note heads um, or uh, with no staff, but with like X note heads sort of showing an overall contour um, in any different combination. Brechtstimme is actually one of the ones that has uh, two two ways that are pretty much unified, either X note heads or X's on the stems. You still want to say Sprechstimme if you want that kind of half sung, half spoken. Um, but those that is basically, I would not play around with other uh, note heads if you're going to do that one, because it's usually one of these. Uh, tongue and lip trills, these are really cool. Whistling, although, we can't all do it. It's called for a lot. I'm not very good at it. Um, so maybe if you do want to whistle, maybe offer like an option. I, my friend Jonah has a piece where he says, you know, if you can't whistle, like do something else. I can't remember, ooh, or something like that. Humming, mm. you can also have us hum with different vowels behind it. Like here's an ah, mm. here's an e. Mm. Little different color, depending on what's going on in the mouth. Uh, vocal muting where you're singing, like, let's like say I'm singing on, and then I put my, my hand over it. You can do different things. All those kinds of things. You can also do, um, vocal meeting can also be considered when the, the mouth is closed, like around, like, like kind of a hum. You can have different amounts of opening. You can play with that. Slide, glissando, and portamento, and again, probably explain what you want, but generally speaking, portamento, you are going to hold the note for a while, and then you're going to connect with a tiny, audible, slidey thing down. <laughs> okay. Usually glissando is, or slide, those, those two things are kind of used interchangeably, um, so say what you want. Usually glissando would mean that I'm going to take the whole length of your note and use it to connect down ah, much slower than a portamento. Sometimes I see people using slide when they mean straight down. Ah, but again, you got to say what you mean. Um, you could also have them like non-specific pitch. Ah, right? Just like a, an up and down or like a slide whistle type sound. Describe these with what shape you want in the mouth. Do you want vowel shape? Do you want a consonant shape? Some consonants we can make noises on. Mm. That's a V. Z. That's a Z. These are all pitches. Z. Right? Most of these sounds are completely possible to, to sing on, right? Um, I had a really cool one. Monica Chu wrote me, or she didn't write me a piece. She wrote a piece that I did where I, I hummed an NG and then I clicked with my, the front of my tongue. And I actually changed notes on the hum, but I can't remember all the things right now because it's late. But that's a cool thing. You can ask for nasality, eh. right? Singing through the nose, um, laughs, giggles, breathing noises in and out, but be aware it's drying. So if you want someone to breathe in and out a lot, um, you know, try to do it with a little bit of moderation and then try not to immediately need us to sing a really long, beautiful legato aria <laughs> without having some water first. Um, do I miss any of these? Oh, whispering. Whispering will not cut very far if you don't have a mic, but it can be cool in a resonant space. It will not project. Um, certain sounds, because they have pitch, cannot be whispered. An M can't be whispered, right? So it would have to be understood by context. If I said, I mean, you probably maybe know that I just whispered mom by context, but 
there is no M is a hum, so it, can't, it doesn't have pitch, right? So it has to be understood by context. Sound effect noises using um, vowels and consonants, right? So shh, ch, ch. these can be um, pitched relatively higher or lower depending on the protrusion of the lips, which will create a longer tube and a lower sound, and also the height of the tongue. So if I want to make a high pitch, pitched SH, I put my tongue in an E position, shh, and I widen my lips, shh. If I want to make a darker shush, I put my tongue more in an oo position, and I protrude my lips, shh. So you can play around and get geeky with all this stuff. Make fun noises, figure out what you did, um, and then describe it, you know? Generally speaking, I really suggest using vowel and consonant noises as inspiration for some of these extended techniques if you're interested in writing them because these are the building blocks of singing. We're really good at doing vowels and consonants. We spend a lot of time working on them. And it's a way um, to, to convey to us what you want in a really effective way. Um, body percussion. I've had songs where I clap and sing at the same time, stomp and sing at the same time. I'm singing something this weekend where I'm playing very simple skin drum as I sing. This can get a bit complicated. And I have definitely had probably the same number of singers who have done those pieces and done the body percussion. An equal number have done those pieces and gotten a friend to do the percussion. Okay, so you, you're looking and writing for a specific kind of nerd when you do some of that stuff. Um, and we nerds will have lots of fun doing them. And people who are feeling like they have a little bit much on their plate may ask a friend and that's okay. Um, quarter tones are not something that we are trained in very much unless you, unless you, you sink it out. Um, but they are very possible. My suggestion is that the most uh, approachable quarter tones are stepwise in a line or a trill or something else. Leaping quarter tone to quarter tone is gonna get a little wonky for most classically trained singers, unless they've spent a lot of time on this. Um, but um, it's totally possible to teach yourself to sing some quarter, known, uh, quarter tone stuff, um, you know, in a, three to four weeks. Um, I wouldn't do a whole piece of entirely quarter tones unless you know somebody has a, a ton of time on their hands and and context gets a little interesting too you know because um at what point does it just sound like they're singing out of tune with the people around them or or what uh, quarter tone choral singing really really very difficult again unless everyone else is holding constant and maybe one group of people or one soloist is doing something cool um but for a soloist or for um uh, certainly i've done some unaccompanied uh, quarter tone singing and some quarter tone singing against a piano and that works fairly well. Um, laugh, giggle. Um, I've, I've had physical instructions of things to do. You know, a lot of singers are good actors. Um, and so physical things to do like while we're singing or in between singing. Um, and like, take a look at this. This is one of my favorite pieces. Yo creo una masca from Cuatro Cancionos Andinas by Gabrielina Frank and Jose Maria Guedes. So here, um, half whisper cupped around the mouth, whisper in um, rhythm, right? Giggle. Uh, here's speaking now, or actually, well, kind of some, some whisper, no, loud half whisper. It's a loud half whisper, but she's got like um, some approximate contours, right? These aren't specific pitches, but they are rhythm and contour out of sync with what the piano is doing um some spoken somewhat reverentially to a fly in a closed half fist so there's some physical stuff we go to full singing then some speaking um do we have other stuff in here a lot of a lot of great um expressive markings here cute smug adamant admiring so this is a great piece for that talk about that okay I might pause here because I want us to have time for questions. I have cor some choral stuff I wanted to share, but let's pause. What other questions do people have? I've gone through a lot. So 
uh, you know, tell me if this gets uh, too far into the weeds. You were, you were talking about harmonic doubling um, at or above the voice line. Mm -hmm. um, uh, seems like the considerations would be a little different with men's voices, which are mm. lower in the range. Like if a baritone is singing, there's not that much room below the baritone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the accompaniment is 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 naturally going to end up being more above the voice than below it. Is that yeah. something you end up worrying about? You know, I think, um, again, the idea of like at the at, at pitch level, I still I probably would find it not super conducive, you know, because it would get pretty muddy in like a piano down there and would probably not be super effective. Um, but yeah, you're right. You're probably talking about the potential to have a little bit more overlap if you're talking about keeping like a particularly a piano in a range where we're not picking the bass so low that it's very muddy. So that's a good point. Um, yeah, I guess when I, yeah, when I do look at Schubert and, um, you know, Faré and stuff, I guess they probably really are mostly writing in that sort of medium range for the piano, whether or not the singer is at treble clef or tre treble clef low. That's a good point. Um, I would, I would think about it a little bit more if you're talking about very dissonant music and where you need people to hear mm -hmm. to hear stuff and i think i still do pop some stuff in that higher octave you know um the, like where the piano right hand is a fair amount for those baritones to get some other context yeah mm -hmm. no that's a good point in in orchestra writing it gets really important to leave a hole for the for the singers, you know, where wherever they're singing, um, other than like light strings or maybe a clarinet or something, um, but yeah, probably for piano art song that we're talking about, sometimes doing up or down the octave. You're probably right. More often, probably the tenors and baritones are sometimes getting uh, stuff in the same octave and just having to sort of deal. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I do think it gets a little different when we're talking about like a really dissonant entrance and what are they going to hear if that's like the one thing they're hanging their hat on. That's when I might say you might want to pop that into that upper octave so that they can really hear it. Or like actually octave above where where they're singing. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. right, in, like 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 into the octave of middle C or something or or above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If we're talking about like a really dissonant texture, and then they need to get something to or hang on to. That's probably where I would say that applies. That's a great question. Yeah. Other questions? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about choir. Um, so some things to think about choir. Choral singers, a lot of choral singers who are very fine singers are not professionals. Many people sing in choirs as community members out of the joy of it, who don't have music degrees. A huge amount of choral singing is happening at liturgical places of worship, a huge amount of choral singing is happening in um, K through 12 and other youth choirs. So um, learner choirs, non-major and community choirs at colleges, right? The, the vast majority of your choral singing is being done by quote unquote amateurs. Um, so it's just something to be aware of that like um, the the people you're writing your most advanced opera arias for are not always the same people who are singing your choral music. Um, SATB is about dividing up voices in a given group of people into four groups um, that will balance given who showed up to audition. The people in those groups may or may not be soloist, sopranos, mezzos, contraltos, tenors, basses, and baritones. Right, so in a, in a lot of um, collegiate and and um, like graduate school, they have choirs. A lot of the very dramatic sopranos are singing alto because they're too loud for the choir if they sing soprano. Right, but they're not they're not really mezzos. Right, um, the alto section is not all contraltos. It's not all very very low alto two folks. Most of us are mezzo sopranos, and because just statistically there are more voices that are soprano than mezzo, mezzo than contralto, 
and there are more voices that are baritone than tenor, this means that if you're evening out that group, guess who's singing tenor? <laughs> Baritones, <laughs> okay? Guess who's singing alto? Some people who would otherwise be sopranos should they pursue their solo voices in the classical sphere. They may never do that, but it's just to be aware of that people get really attached to their voice type or their voice group, but these are different things. Um, generally speaking, a more moderate range is a good idea to think about unless you're really going all out and writing the hallelujah chorus, you know, when you have that kind of group. Um, one of the things to be aware of with choral singers is you have more than one person or even ensemble singing in, in quartets or duets is that um, if people aren't all singing the exact same thing at the same time, which they probably won't all the time, you are layering different words on top of each other. So if somebody's singing ah in the tenors and at the same time somebody singing e in the altos, this may or may not sound as good and may or may not be understood. So what you see, again, if you go and look at the great masterworks, is when new text is introduced, it's often done in that like imitative form, right? In the polyphonic works, right? Where the new text gets introduced and then off the sopranos go singing some long melisma, ha 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 ha. And then in come the tenors with the same text repeated, and now they're singing the ah ha 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 ha's. And that kind of becomes a wash of sound so that you can hear the other people. And by the time everybody's entered, you've heard that text a billion times and you just are enjoying the texture. So to the extent that you're writing music where there's a lot of different lines doing different things instead of like hymnal style lined up chordal, be aware of text intelligibility and think about, are people gonna catch the words before all of this goes on. If you're wanting a really beautiful blended chord and you have three or four different vowel sounds going on, that may or may not sound as pretty as you want it to. It might be nice to kind of unify everyone on the same vowel by the time we get to that moment. If you, now, likewise, if you don't want that, that could be cool too, okay? I mean, that could be really, really expressive. To, to actually specifically take advantage of the crunch. So like all of these things exist just as tools in your toolbox. Go back to your knowledge or discover some new knowledge of the harmonic series. Um, if you want a clear, balanced chord, you want to think about the way that the harmonic series has bigger intervals on the bottom, and as we go up higher, things get tighter clustered. Likewise, when you're writing for choir, or by the way, any ensemble, orchestra, band, anyone, bigger intervals between the lower voices, tighter intervals between the upper voices. Generally, we say, and this is again that old part writing, no more than one octave between adjacent voices, no more than one octave between soprano to alto, no more than one octave from alto to tenor, and then as much space as you want between tenors and basses without them being outside of their range. Um, if you have a giant gap in the middle, again, things will sound less unified. Maybe that's what you want, but a lot of times it's what you don't want and it just happens by accident, right? Why does it happen? Because you're at the keyboard and you're doing two voices in the left hand for tenors and baritones and basses or whatever, and two voices for sopranos and altos, and your hands move like this. That's why it happens if you're writing at the keyboard, okay? And it's great to write at the keyboard, but this is why it happens, so don't do that. Um, unless you want to. Likewise, um, the darkness, the relative darkness or in the extreme case, muddiness and maybe non-clarity, non maybe in a cool way, maybe in a bad way, versus clearness or brightness or extreme brightness, if you want it, will be determined by how much space is there are between the two lower voices. And particularly also, if you're writing in triadic music, where is your first third of the chord? So if you are you know, doubling things, the root, tends to get doubled the most, 
then the fifth and the least to balance out a chord you need the least third to and, and that that follows the harmonic series again or if you're writing a seventh chord right you need the least of the seventh or if you're writing a ninth chord the least of the ninth one person singing the ninth or one one line singing the ninth will create the ninth you don't need to double that across every single divided soprano one two three four right um so unless you want to right unless you want that sound um but a lot of people come to me with music that they're not super happy with how it's sounding and this is why um if you want to create really nice dark texture tighten up your low voices tighten up your tenors and and basses um shove your your voice at lower voices closer together um be aware that choral singers are used to tuning down to the basses or the lowest sounding voice so that's a big responsibility right um this also means that that sometimes if they're asked to to enter without the low voice there we can get into some pitchy issues right um so so it can be a vulnerable moment that's really beautiful i have a piece like that on um, first winter rain that that starts with um well it, it's soprano then i think it's soprano then alto then tenor then bass and it's descending and uh, imitative entrance and and a lot of the time on those first rehearsals by the time the basses enter we have we have gone flat right so it's a tricky thing i've asked them to do i asked them to do it i like it but it is a tricky thing to be aware we love the sound of a cappella choir i love it it's wonderful but consider that most choirs have a pianist on staff and that pianist on staff is going to either play their notes in reduction to help them learn it and then not come to the concert to play well they'll be playing other things or they could be playing on your piece with you and they could provide a lot of pitch support so it's something to consider to um to write some of your music with with piano um vocal music notation i'll just briefly talk on this and then we'll be almost done uh so hyphens you have to have hyphens between your syllables and this is one of the things that happened to me in one of my other examples is that i put them in and then you change something in your sp spacing and they get hidden because we all all of our softwares have some defaults where if the syllables get too close together they disappear you got to look for those and try to make them I, i'm gonna have to go change that in mine it's so much harder to read this if the syllable goes away because en is not a word and i have to write it in um slurs mean keep singing this sound on these notes that's what that means dynamics expressive marking oh that's that's the title of the piece these go above the staff for singers beam by beat as in instrumental music please extender lines these go to the start of the last note i often see these trailing over here uh we don't need that they go to the the beginning of the last note most of the time this is just like you hit the space bar too many times in sibelius or whatever translations and pronunciations we use word for word translations if you're not writing in english um or a language that you you specifically speak fluently um whatever that is whatever those are um you need to work off of a word for word translation that tells you exactly what every little word means even if the word order is not the same as english so that you don't shove a word up on an important cool note that's just the word and okay um a poetic translation is the version of that translation that sounds super nice that you put in the program notes right that that has all the right grammar um and it can be also very useful because usually they're made by really skilled translators who are also conveying things like the lyricism of the poem or the imagery or things like that and taking a few more licenses a singing translation is that annoying thing they put in some like books for younger singers where it rhymes and it's really bad <laughs> okay um and that is not that that's the worst of them all because they've taken the most liberties it's the worst of them all for you as a composer if you're trying to set the text or for me as a teacher if i'm trying to get my students to understand the italian okay the singing translation is just a stop gap for them to get used to singing in a specific melodic and harmonic language international phonetic alphabet or ipa is our friend as singers it's a system of notating um the sounds of language a little different than than what you'll see in most um dictionaries 
that you'll see, although Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online does provide IPA, as does Collins Dictionary for English, and Collins also has some of the other primary operatic European languages, Spanish, German, French, I think they all do those for IPA and Italian, so that can be very useful. Um, and then those are those resources. This has been so much fun. What other questions can I can I answer for y'all before we before we say goodnight? I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Uh, uh, kind of nitpicky question. Go for it. Um, for particularly chorals or small ensembles of voices, um, are you typically trained to tune chords with just harmony? or is that never even like brought into <laughs> like there, how are your ears trained to hear chords i guess is there a piano involved if there's a piano uh, involved say, we're say, tuning to the okay. piano right but let's say a cappella if it's a cappella trained singers will know how to hear when the chord pops into true harmonic series, you know, beauty. Right, okay. Younger singers, community singers, um, singers throwing a concert together real quickly may or may not, and to the, they may or may not, especially if they're using the piano as a, as a strong learning tool, for, for ensemble, like if they're learning by having someone sing along, they may or may not get to that point. Most choral directors work on this with their choirs. The question is how much were the choirs aware of it, the, you know, the singers, and how much did they take that on and start to, to feel that and hear it? You know, the vast majority of us perform lots of our rep with piano, even almost all of our opera rep with piano, because there's almost no funding for us to do it with anyone else. And so um, singers are really good at tuning into whoever's around them. So when we get to the orchestra, it's not like we're suddenly singing out of tune. We absorb that, right? And accept it. You tell me it's B flat and it's a B flat, you know? <laughs> um, you tell me this is A442 or A441 or no, we're doing Baroque tuning, you know? And I, I'm like, cool, I learned the tune. It's gonna feel a little different by the time we get to Baroque tuning. And that can, you know, by once it's a, basically a half step, that can create some challenges. Um, so I would say like, if you looked around town, um, do the singers who sing generally with resonance ensemble know what that feels like and sounds like? Yeah. Or um, in Mulieribus or uh, Capella Romana, do the singers that sing with, A church choir have that skill yet? Probably not, generally speaking, right? Yeah. Or if they do, it's to the extent of the director told me I needed to sing more sharp or whatever, right? And I raised my eyebrows and it sort of felt better, right? Yeah. Um, if you don't mind the follow up, I mean, I'm no. asking partly because, like, uh, I've been learning about sort of different uh, tuning systems and different kind of global cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the uh, ones that I came across, which was uh, really interesting, was the uh, uh, the Lithuanian uh, Swartines. Mm -hmm. And apparently they sing whole and half st uh, whole steps just like slightly bigger than a whole step. <laughs> and things like this. And I was cool. like, if I, it, it sounds really striking and really interesting, but I was also kind of like, if I wanted to use that sound, how would I even begin to describe what's going on to a singer? Like, would I have to get super technical and say, you're singing, we're aiming for like, you know, this many, this kind of interval? Wow. Yeah. Because it was, at a certain point, that's going to compound, right? Right. Yeah. I think when you're talking about um, asking a group, even a quartet, to start to get 
into singing into a different tuning system than we've been trained in. Right. I think you're looking for some real specific nerdy folks. Um, and I think we have a lot of really lovely and nerdy folks here in town who are also pretty darn busy. And I don't know how many of us there are who could invest, who would be as excited to invest the time in, like I, go out and try to find them um, for sure. But I think we are entering a world where like, just singing quarter tones and keeping that up is pretty hard. And that's just halfway. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, it's super cool. I almost wonder if like, I don't know, is there Lithuanian cultural centers in Oregon? Like, are there people here who are really good at that? Um, and then like, what happens if, if they were leading it? And, and then a few other people joined them and could sort of absorb that sound. I don't know. Yeah, it's really interesting because we are, we're so, we're so top, tied into our 12, 12 chromatic pitches, aren't we? And it's, yeah, it is a limitation. You know, it absolutely is a limitation. Um, yeah. How, how does that translate to playing on the, on a string instrument? Uh, it's also similar because, uh, like we, I, I don't know. It's something that I'm grappling with because I'm having to figure out how to explain to my students what playing in tune means. And okay. <laughs> like, um, and that can be really hard when you're dealing with like sixth graders or elementary schoolers who are still developing like really abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like uh, you can, you can start to really feel out physically these very fine uh finger placements uh to kind of get those things and like as long as your ear knows what you're aiming for you can start to piece it together i mean i know um oh, what was the quartet that did the ben johnson quartets is that the kepler oh man uh, i'm not i'm not sure um uh, ben Johnston's quartets, you know, pretty infamously having, uh, you know, what, like 40, 50 divisions of the octave yeah. kind of situation. And it took them years, yeah. years to record the whole set. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's possible. Uh, yeah. And like, I think it's easier with notating microtones to kind of be like, oh, yeah, like a quarter tone is just this much instead right. of a half step, which would be this much. Yeah. But, you know, like you said, your voice, like you don't have that physical uh, um, fingerboard to kind of reference um, yeah. like the distance. So I think you're really talking about probably a situation where like people would probably be on, on a, a multi-month and maybe multi-year sort of rewiring of, of, of their system, you know? Um, yeah. And that could be really cool with the right um, group of people who want to do that, you know? Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's it's humbling to realize how how deep we can get into one tradition and how little we are equipped to to slide into another tradition, you know? It's like, whoa, yeah, don't know, don't know much about a lot of things, you know? Right, yeah. That's cool. <clears throat> well, fun, folks. Thanks for chatting voice with me. Are hey. there any other last questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks absolutely. so much. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, I did have one more question. Go for it. Um, it came up with looking at your score and you used the word maiden as an example. Mm -hmm. um, now in that, um, it's about setting the text and where to split on the, if you're doing maiden on two separate notes, you know, to imagine you would, um, uh, where to put the D. Um, I, yeah. I find that a lot of the choirs, if I put M-A-I-D on the first note, um, they're already doing the diphthong before they get to the end of that. I want the pure vowel A. <clears throat> they're already anticipating the D, and they, yeah. they diphthong it. And so I want to put M-A-I on one side and D-E on the other because it avoids that. <laughs> but I've been given a lot of crap about that because yeah. it's a dictionary. Work, work. Yeah, yeah. So the convention is 
um, to, to divide the words as the dictionary does, which is not how we sing them, right, all the time. That's very frustrating, right? And I was just working on this in a lesson with a student this week. Um, I think one reason is the minute we say not to do that dictionary, we will be looking at a million different ways to do this. And sounds like maybe for in this one instance, that would have been a quick fix for this one choir. But generally speaking, what the choir needs to do, what I would say as a voice here is, you guys yell, you know, you have to learn this on more than the word maiden. You all need to keep the first part of the vowel and not off wide to the diphthong and squish the D right before the next right. note. Right, you know what I mean? And in fact, maiden, in this case, I actually sing, I would sing the D on the next note. Mm -hmm. I would start it. And that's not how it's written. But the minute we start going there with non-experimental music, right? There are totally times when I've been asked to break apart a word, you know, and sing maiden, you know, and hey, then or whatever, and that's time for that. But otherwise, this is about the the singers you're dealing with being on an education journey of needing to be able to read and hold that word and syllable and know what their mouth needs to do. Yeah. And so I think the the truly the most useful thing in most cases, unless you're doing something cool, is to trust that that's that's something for yes, you can give that feedback and also the conductor and the singers have got to figure it out and they've got to get their their technique in a, in a row because it's not just that word it's learning that that's a default for all the time and in fact some people would see mai and they actually might it didn't sound like it maybe in this situation but they actually might close to the e anyway because they're seeing two vowels they right yeah even so more. where are we now now we're yeah. now we're yeah now it's we're like lost right you wouldn't recognize the word and the sight reading yeah. they would not I mean, MAI, they might go, if it happened to be on one page, right. and the other, they might go my. Right. You know? So, you know, in a very, very few instances, a solution mm -hmm. to this can be to like put a little note in, like in IPA, may, you know? But again, this is probably getting into things that people are going to do in rehearsal, you know? Yeah. Um, I agree. It's yeah. really we're, we're weird. Composers like to be such control freaks. If we hear it in our head, I will I will try and put it down there exactly what I want, sure. but this is a rule that I'm not allowed to do that, and it kind of makes me a little frustrated. Well, I mean, <laughs> you can try the other thing and see if it helps I have, or hurts. and I, I okay. get complaints, so you're right. <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's so important. Like, have you ever had a student perform a piece, and um they're they're making mistakes all over the place right and so like is it is it the where this person is at in their musical journey or is it the notation or is it the piece right and students make mistakes all over pieces by very famous you know composers whose pieces have been tried and true and survived the ages it has nothing to do with the notation it has nothing to do with the piece it just has to do with where they are in their musical journey and um I think that there are the reason that we are control freaks or whatever is because um oh yeah no problem uh is because we we've been trained to do so you know and and the modern music that that most of us have been studying has gotten more and more and more and more specific in its notation um partly because we don't have a performance practice yet and may never have because the diversity of styles within what even this little tiny niche that we call classical concert music, whatever that is anymore, is now so wide that I don't know that there ever will be one single performance practice the way that we talk about a romantic or a baroque performance practice. I'm not sure that there will be, you know, so I mean it's it's no fault of ours that we get really nitpicky in 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 our scores and, and really specific. Um, I absolutely know that every time I do something that's very fussy, that someone says, hey, you don't need to do that. That's like really fussy. It's because somebody told me to sometime or someone told me. I remember once I put in a range, you know, for, for a tempo, like whatever, 72 to 76 or something like that. And, and it was a master class. And the whatever, the dick master class teacher said, well, is it 72 or 76? And I'm like, I don't know, somewhere in there, whatever feels good, like plus or minus, you know? And they were like, well, which one is it? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what it, it, that's the range that's acceptable to me 
you know? So, but you know, what did that lead me to do for a while was be like, every time I wrote a tempo to feel like I had to just pick one number, right? But, but the acoustic is going to vary and if it's echoey, you'll have to go slower. <laughs> right, no, I just, I just met with a student today who's learning um, a Fari song that is marked quarter note equals 60. And Bernack, the leading expert, right, who has a whole book says, sing it, quarter note equals 60. And this singer's like, it feels too fast. And I'm like, well, let's hear it. And I'm like, yeah, it does kind of sound too fast. There's a beautiful, low bass, resonant, gorgeous voice. And I'm like, well, sing it whatever you want. They're singing it at quarter note equals 52. And it's great. And it does not sound too slow in their voice. So it's like, you know what? So anyway, we have to unlearn these things, you know? So what I would say is, good experiment. You tried something, seems like, in my, what I would say, it sounds like it's, that is a piece of growing up that this ensemble has to do with their consonants and their and their diphthongs. And as a voice teacher, if, if everybody's saying perfect diphthongs, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's really hard, you know? And in popular oh, styles, uh, it can be right to close to the diphthong really, yeah. I, I had another question, wondering, yeah, is sorry. it possible to get the slides from tonight? Sure, yeah, um, okay. email me. I'll put it in my comments. Here, I have to run, but thank you so much. Yeah, Appreciate for it. sure. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Do you have another question, Dan? For another time. It's been two hours or an hour and a half. You've been uh, uh, talking. I don't more. mind. I mean, I'm here if you got a question. Uh, um, nothing right now. Thanks. I'll, uh, okay. I'll definitely uh, uh, have stuff to ask another time. This is great. Very uh, uh, information packed. Yeah, I, I, um, gosh, I can't even believe that in my like wildest dreams, I thought I might talk about other things because this was already so much, but it's fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, everyone, and um, take care and see you soon. See you around. Okay. Bye, everybody.